you for uh, inviting me for the TOF conference. This is my second conference. I was here um, last year. I want to go straight into the slides. So TOF, as we know, stands for Tetralogy of Fallow. Fallow. It's a heart condition. It's when you have a child that looks a bit bluish. Okay? I'm at the wrong event. I'll leave now. <laughs> right. So if you go to any GP, that'll be the response you get. Okay? Because the TOF that we know as GPs is Tetralogy of Fallow. This condition is twice as common as TOF, uh, with a tracheoesophageal fistula. And the cool thing about it, which is not cool for the parents, but something that GPs will always remember, is that you have a child that sometimes turns blue. And for those parents who might have witnessed that in their child when they're having a sticky or having an ill episode, you won't forget that. And as a GP, you don't forget that. So this is why quite often TOF is mit mistaken for this heart condition. Uh, it is a common complex congenital condition, but like I said, it's twice as common as tracheoesophageal fistula, so a GP might actually see somebody with this condition in their working life. Um, my title for the, my topic today is how to get the best out of your GP. Most internet sites will have you believe that that's what a GP patient relationship looks like. Um, to be fair, most of my patients are probably that age group, um, but that's probably what your GP looks like on a day to day basis. And actually, um, Recently on my Facebook feed, uh, this came up and I thought it was quite uh, apt. Um, just so you're all aware, I'm somewhere between the, the top corner there and 20 years. There are a couple of doctors who are closer to here now. So I'll just, um, I'm Cameron Ahmed. I'm what we call a portfolio GP. So I work in general practice. I do GP work, but I also do a number of other roles and I've got some slides to just talk about those other roles as well today. Um, I, um, work, I did some surgery before I became a GP, so I actually worked with Professor Griffin up in the northeast in the upper GI unit um, and then saw the light and decided I wanted to be a GP and have been a GP since 2009. I also do a bit of work with the Department of Justice, so we do uh, tribunals for benefits, so I'm happy to take some questions, or if people have got questions on the benefit system, I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, and I work with the British Boxing Board of Control, so occasionally I meet relatively famous people. Um, this is Zane, he changed my life three years ago. Um, the chap earlier on mentioned um, uh, uh, PTSD, and for me, I think, I still find it very difficult to talk about what happened three years ago. Zayn was born with TOF, and um, the TOF repair, he was born at 33 weeks, the TOF repair, and I can't say thank you again to Mr. Lander, who's here today, um, who worked on Zayn. Zayn subsequently developed uh, an infarcted bowel and had six laparotomies and the thoracotomy. Thankfully, he's home. He's doing really, really well. Uh, I've also worked with uh, TOF on this postcard that we designed. Initially, the thoughts were that we'd design a leaflet, but we thought the postcard would be much more handy and get it to your GP. And what I recommend to all TOF parents is to get this, get it to your GP and get it scanned onto your, onto your child's records or onto your own records. Once it's scanned onto records, it's always there. You can refer to it. You can ask the GP to refer to it. Um, Common complaints of a broken system. I call it a broken system because part of the NHS does feel like it's broken at the moment. I've worked through the last 10 years. There's been a lot of change in 10 years, so I'll try and summarize some of that in my slides. Um, so what do patients often complain about to us? Never get an appointment. Will I actually see a doctor? Um, the doctor doesn't know what my condition is or what what to do about it or understand my symptoms. And that's quite common from tough parents and, and tough children. Um, the doctor doesn't refer me, they're just trying to save money. Uh, the doctor doesn't prescribe me the medication I want, they're just trying to save money. Uh, and the doctor never calls me in for a review or an assessment. And I'll try and tackle each of these points as we go through the slides. First, I wanted to do a bit of positive message for GPs. And, you know, there's been quite a bit in the news about how GPs are the bedrock, bedrock of the NHS. You know, if general practice fails, the whole NHS fails. The one thing that separates us from private healthcare systems and the way other systems run is the role of the family practitioner and the role of the GP. Um, but the, at the moment, GPs are leaving faster than we are being replaced. And that is a sign of the pressure that we've suffered over the last 10 years. Um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the changes that have occurred. 
Um, so we are losing a net reduction of 1,252 GPs per year. Um, and the work isn't getting any less. Um, the key message for yourselves is that GPs are generalists, not specialists. And a general practitioner is expected to know something about everything, whereas a specialist is expected to know everything about something. Nearly everything. <laughs> Um, so, I thought I'd give everybody a flavour of GP workload. Now, uh, I feel like this chap every day, because I'm always late, I actually made it early here today, which surprised me. Um, a typical day is between 8 and 6.30, that's 10 and a half hours. And I've made a list of some of the things that we have to do in those 10 and a half hours. And this is a rough idea of my, one of my days last week, which was an average day. I didn't pick a, any particular day, I just picked the day that uh, after which um, I did this slide. Um, so there are a number of clinics, there are a number of administrative tasks to do. We have lunch time where we do our home visits. And home visits aren't just seeing sick patients at home. They often involve completing doc documentation such as cremation forms, death certificates. We're regularly asked to meet with the CCG, which is the health authority. And we are also regularly asked to attend what we call MDT meetings, the so multidisciplinary team meetings and peer review meetings to discuss how general practice is working across the area and what differences we can make to the health of the area. Um, the other thing that we often do in this home visiting time is see patients who are palliative. A lot of patients now are being supported to die at home. So the GP is actively involved in seeing those patients and making sure that the care that they receive at home is supportive. Um, we then, if we add up all the hours, we end up having 14 hours work in a 10 hour day. And we end up with a 60 plus hour week. Now, quite often, your GP, there will be one GP for every, well, it used to be 1,500 patients, but because of the GPs leaving, there's an average of one GP for every 2,500 patients. The average practice size is about 3,000. So there may be one to 1.2 GPs. So your GP might not be there on one day of the week when he gets somebody else to cover. But like me today, I've got my laptop in the bottom corner on a chair there. There's a clinic that's running that I'm in charge of. And they'll be messaging me constantly throughout this conference. And I'm at work tomorrow morning, 8 till 2. So. Uh, it doesn't stop, and this is what the government expect is eight till eight, seven days a week. Um, we routinely take work home. Um, so I think that that's just a, a summary to give people a flavor of why there's difficulties getting hold of a GP and what the pressures are on a GP. So no more golf days. And I think it's been some time since Mr. Lander practices putting like that. <laughs> but I think the pressures are not just in general practice, but they're with our surgical colleagues as well. Because as GPs, we try to control the influx of patients into hospital. And when we can't do that, then it puts more pressure on the hospital system. So going back to the common complaints of the broken system, um, appointments are never available. The total number of appointments with a GP have actually increased, despite the number of GPs decreasing. But we see more of patients who are aging, who have common conditions like asthma, diabetes, and we see increasingly more mental health patients. So 40% of my workload on any given day will be patients with mental health issues. Um, and we also have new treatments, which means that we have to see patients repeatedly. So patients with chronic conditions like asthma, like diabetes, there are now new medications, there are now new inhalers. So we see them much more often than we used to before, because in the past we could offer them two treatments and say, sorry that we've offered you everything, see you later. But we don't do that anymore. Um, so tips for getting appointments with your GP. The most important thing is to learn your practice system. Every practice across the country will have a different system. We, in one of my practices in, in Wolverhampton, we have a telephone triage system that starts at 8 in the morning and finishes at midday. If you phone any time between 8 a.m. and midday, you will get a call back. If you need to see a doctor, you will then see a doctor. It's a, it's a guarantee. We have 
the majority of patients phoning at one minute past eight and nobody phoning at 11.30. Whereas there's no difference if you phone at one minute past eight to 11.30 to whether you get an appointment. But we'll still say patients saying, well, I can't get an appointment. I rang 84 times this morning, doctor. Um, and we would advise those patients, well, ring at 11.30 and you'll ring once, you'll get through and you'll still get the equal chance of getting an appointment. So know your practice system. Most practices will keep two thirds of appointment as same day appointments on the day. So if you ring today and say, can I have an appointment, please? They will say yes in four weeks time. That's the next routine appointment, but there will be urgent appointments available every day. Um, a lot of practices will have a policy that they won't turn away children under five. That is variable. And actually, the policy usually applies up until a certain time of the day. So by midday, most GP practices need to be able to establish what they're doing for the rest of the day. So asking for a home visit later on in the day or asking for an appointment later on in the day becomes more difficult because they've probably already accommodated quite a lot of people for that day. Um, some practices run an on-call doctor appointment system. So again, there'll be a doctor that will be on-call purely to ring up patients who need to be seen or see patients who phone up for an urgent appointment. Um, the biggest trouble, going back to the previous slide, is just, just not enough GPs. So that puts pressure on the system to the total number of appointments that are available. Um, get friendly with your practice manager. Practice managers are normally around between nine and four. When your young one is well or when you are well, make an appointment with the practice manager and ask them about the practice system and also ask them about how's the best way that I can get an appointment. And they'll be able to tell you that. Um, it's part of the practice manager's role to engage with patients. And most practices will have a patient engagement group. So try and get on the group. And then that way you can have some influence on how the practice shapes its appointments, but how to get in for those appointments. Don't be fussy about seeing a doctor. And I'll come on to, to why in, in the next slide. Um, but we now have new roles like advanced nurse practitioner, clinical pharmacist. If you get in, get in first. That's the most important thing. So will I actually see a doctor? Now, these roles, the advanced nurse practitioner, the clinical pharmacist, um, they may even be a specialist nurse who's trained in paediatrics, who's then decided that she wants to go out into the community or he wants to go out into the community and work in general practice and is now working as an advanced nurse practitioner in a GP setting. This is somebody who's had basic nursing training, quite a bit of time in hospital, quite a bit of time in primary care, and then has done prescribing training and patient assessment training. So they are quite competent at assessing patients and prescribing medication. They might be paediatric specialists or respiratory specialists. So you may actually get a better service from them for your little one than you may do from a doctor who's never heard of TOF. So ask, and if you ask the practice manager, they'll be able to give you an idea of how the nurse is qualified and what services they will and will not provide. Um, similarly for clinical pharmacists. So before I did this presentation, um, about a week ago, I put a um, post on the TOF Facebook page. And I asked um, anybody if they had any questions that they'd like me to try and answer today. And there were some questions about medication. And if you go into a GP practice and you want to see a doctor, we may know some things about medication. But between ourselves, we all have this book and this book, which is given to us every six months, which contains all medications, all medication forms, prices, and how to administer those, administer those medications. And the Department of Health sends that out to every doctor every six months. They also send the same book out to every pharmacist. So actually, if you spoke to a clinical pharmacist, they would have a much better idea because they spend their life working with this book about what medications are available, what forms of medication are available. So can you get this in a liquid form? Can I get this in granules that can dissolve? Can I dissolve this? Can I give this via a PEG tube? That's something that a pharmacist can answer far quicker than a doctor will be able to answer. So if you have queries about medication and how you use your medication, and your practice has a clinical pharmacist, utilize that resource. Um, befriend the receptionist. Even the monstrous ones that turn you away. <laughs> they are a few. I know about them. Um, the receptionists 
actually some of them have worked in the practice for decades and they know the system, they know the doctors, they know who will see what and who will find it more difficult to see other conditions. So befriend the receptionist. Um, as I said before, the nurse practitioners may have much more experience with upper GI or children than the doctor themselves and may have much more uh, interaction with children. So find out about whether that's the case in your surgery. Um, when I said about before about getting in, if you get into the practice to see any of these clinicians, they will always be supervised by a GP. So if these clinicians are not happy with what's presented to them, they can go and knock on the GP's door and ask them to pop in and have a look. Okay? This is exactly the same as if I took my little one to Mr. Lander's clinic and saw Mr. Lander's registrar, and if they were not happy, they'd be able to ask Mr. Lander to pop in and have a look. So get in first, get your foot through the door. Um, the doctor knows nothing about my condition. The doctor doesn't understand any of my symptoms. So again, going back to the comments I made about GPs being generalists versus specialists. Now, the average GP practice is between 2,000 and 3,000 patients. The incidence of TOF is between 1 in 3,000 to 1 in 4,500. So that means you might get one TOF patient in every other GP practice. We usually have about 100 to 150 births in our practice per year. So I might see a tough birth once every 30 years. Sound like that. <laughs> and that's why GPs may not have experience with tough children. Now, the other um, problem is that most tough parents, and this is quite common in the tough webpage, um, will reflex contact the, the, the specialist, the consultant team, if they have problems. But that means that as a GP, I will have no involvement with a tough child or tough uh, teen until they get to 16, 17, 18 years old and they hit the point of transition into adult services. And the only interaction I will have with the GP is to receive a regular letter from the hospital clinic to say that the tough person was seen today or they've been to the A&E today and they were treated in, in this method. Now, we are working with colleagues to try and see if we can um, get supporting better letters and better information from secondary care about what's happened, and more so a care plan. So if the specialists can provide care plans that detail common issues with tough children and common ways of managing those issues, or at least the first few steps of management, that would hopefully encourage more people to attend the GP practice first. We often get uh, people asking for supporting letters and uh, letters for benefits at the age of 16, and we've never seen them. So we find it quite difficult to write supporting letters because they've been seen by secondary care specialists. Um, if you can, identify a doctor with a surgical or paediatric special interest. During GP training, there are thousands of doctors who have to go through a number of specialities to become a GP. So we become a doctor, we work a couple of years in hospital, and then we go into more years in hospital, but through specialist jobs. Two-fifths of GPs, if not more, will not have done a paediatric job. Okay? So they will have experience with working with children by working in A&E or working in uh, obstetrics where they might see a newborn, but they may not have done a paediatric job. Okay? Um, so find somebody who has. And if you feel that you get information from a colleague that a GP in another practice has and they're more receptive, change practices. It's very easy. Um, make a routine appointment while well. And I've done this with my little one. So you might think, well, he's a GP. What's he talking about? And, you know, he, he probably just keeps his little one at home and does everything himself, prescribes antibiotics himself. <laughs> We're not allowed. <laughs> Uh, actually, you can get struck off for prescribing antibiotics to your own children or family. Um, so it's something that we don't do. Um, but I have booked a, a review with my little one's GP and went along, discussed medication, discussed health, discussed what they're like when they're well. And as GPs, the best thing we can do is to see somebody when they're well so that we can get a better appreciation of when they're not well. 
The doctors don't refer me, they're saving money. It's not to do with money. Um, often we need to have specific questions answered before we can do referrals. So we, we had a question earlier on about dietitians and SALT team. There are certain hoops I need to go through and certain questions I need answered before I can do a referral. I, as a GP, I'd have to display a three month a period of weight loss before I can refer somebody who's got dietitian issues, as an example. So I will send you away for three months and say, keep an eye on their weight. As a sympathetic GP, I might send you away for four weeks and say, keep an eye on their weight, and then we'll do the referral. But there will be a delay in receiving that referral, and there is a shortage of dietitians. So there will be a delay in doing that. So as per Mr. Lander's advice earlier on, actually asking the specialist to refer to a specialist dietitian is often the best way. Um, so what is the test? What's the question you're trying to answer? This is what we ask ourselves when we're looking at tests and referrals. Why are we doing the referral? What's the question we're trying to answer? What's the best test for this? And can the GP actually request the test? I can't request an endoscopy in a three-year-old. It just would not happen. It's not something a GP can do. Um, so often speak to the specialist and have a look at the TOF book. I don't get any shares in the TOF book, <laughs> but it is a useful resource and I advise all parents to read it and have a look at it. Uh, the doctor will not prescribe medication I know I need. They're just trying to save money. Again, it's very little to do with money. Children's medication does not cost a lot of money. We, have, we see many patients on diabetic medication, asthma medication, stroke medication, that cost, and painkillers that cost hundreds of pounds a month per box of tablets. Children's medication is not relatively cheap. Um, but GPs are only allowed to prescribe according to the license of use of a medication. In the past, we used to do trials of medication. So I might say, well, I've heard this medication is good, so I'll trial you with this. These are the risks, these are the benefits. I'll keep your name and we'll see you in a month to make sure they work. But the legal system kicked in. And over the last 10 years, to do that, you pretty much have to apply for ethical approval, which is a 25 page document that's sent off and you have to wait for it to come back. And so GPs don't do this anymore. GPs on average will pay £10,000 plus per year in insurance. If you work in a hospital, the hospital pays your insurance costs. So we're not going to risk that, which will go up. It's based on a no claims system. Um, when there's a chance that if there is an issue with the medication, that we get into quite a lot of legal wrangling. And so we don't do that. Now, I've given a, a name of a common medication here called Domperidone. I used to use it a lot. It's used to help uh, with children with reflux as a third line medication uh, and helps with gastric motility, so food moving down. It also is really good for helping breastfeeding mothers to produce more milk. However, a few years ago, there were reports that in a very, very small number of patients, it can cause heart problems. And the group that we're talking about were elderly patients. But we have now a blanket ban on GPs prescribing that for any reason whatsoever. And where we do prescribe it, we have to prescribe it for the shortest period of time possible. So three to five days. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so that your GP is still prescribing it. It'll be flagged up monthly with the GP by the health authority to why they're prescribing that medication. It is safe, okay? It's, if you have underlying heart problems, then you shouldn't use it. But actually the Medicines and Health Regulation Authority put out uh, an article on it saying that it should not be prescribed for longer than a few days at a time. Uh, I've used it in the past, in my surgical life, for patients for years on end, okay? And that maybe should not happen with the information that we've got. But for short periods of time where it's helping with gastric motility, it's safe. We are now getting some information from hospital colleagues saying, please, can you prescribe this? And if a hospital consultant says, please, can you prescribe this? I can prescribe it because in essence, they've taken the responsibility of me issuing that medication. Yeah. So it, it, it should not be continued long term. Um, 
I think, I think the arguments for the benefits outweigh, well, the arguments for the benefit are strong. Whether they outweigh the risk or not is for the Medicine and Health Regulation Authority, but we're getting more and more letters. So I recently received a letter from a neonatology consultant saying, please can you give this to mum for breastfeeding because it increases breast milk volumes. Um, it's safe, this is all the information, this is the information I've given to mum, please will you prescribe. When we have all that information from the specialist, we will prescribe it. But it's not licensed for GPs to issue straight off. Okay, and there's lots of medications I can give examples of that are like that, that are not licensed for a GP to issue. Um, and in the past we probably used to, but more so now we don't. Um, so there was a question on the Facebook uh, article that I put out about using inhalers for non-asthma patients. That's another example. We can't issue inhalers for non-asthma patients. We do for small children when they're wheezy then that's, there's documented evidence of benefit for that. But long-term in adults, if it helps with your TOF, TOF is not an indication for an inhaler. So it has to be instigated by a specialist or we have to receive instruction from a specialist saying, please, could you try X for this condition? Because the specialist has authority to do that. We don't. Um, so this is where we try to get clear letters from the specialist about exactly what medication we should use and how we should be using those. Um, medicine and the law, I just thought I'd put this slide in. The law is very black and white. We could spend all day talking about all the colours that Picasso has used in this particular picture, but actually med the law is very black and white. And it is coming down on uh, healthcare with some force and more so on GP practices. And I'm sure you've probably all seen this no win, no fee uh, regularly on daytime TV. Uh, the doctor never calls me in for a review. Uh, as I said earlier on, the best thing to do is to book a review with a GP every six months to a year when you're well and get them to know you. And then when you do go in when you're not well, they will know that there's a problem. There's some do's. So ring 111. Begrudgingly, I put that in. It's the hit and miss service. But <laughs> um, I would say that if you need reassurance or if you're not sure, ring 111. We have lots of videos that go onto the tough. Facebook page of children who are not breathing right. Uh, in those instances, I would say if you're not sure, ring 111. More than likely, they will ask you to be assessed, but they'll be able to guide you to where to be assessed, and it gives you the reassurance rather than waiting for somebody to respond on Facebook. Make a plan. Um, so to manage common symptoms. Now, um, there was a question earlier on about uh, feeding and strictures and, and things like that. As parents, we have to start becoming scientists. And as much as we try and let our children get on and do what they want, it's not possible with tough children. We have to be very strict about recording. What are they eating? What went well? What didn't go well? What should I try next time? Do I move back to what I tried last week because what I tried this week didn't really help? Shall I take a bit longer to go from what I tried last week to what I'm trying this week? Is there something I could put in between that will work better? And so you do become a bit of a scientist, scribbling out and working on it again and again and again. Um, and so make a plan. Make a plan for what you do if your child had a cold or a heavy flu. Uh, and make a plan for what you do when they have common flare-ups. So when the reflux suddenly gets, gets worse, what would you do? And that may involve using regular paracetamol, putting the bed wedge back in or using something different. If you, you don't use a bed wedge, slow down, slow down a feed if you're peg feeding at the moment. Uh, make sure you're giving them small but often fluid volumes during the day. Uh, and then stick to your plan. And actually, you'll find that when you make a plan, if you stick to your plan, it, most of the time it will get you through. Um, you can also contact community nurses. These are uh, like district nurses, they go out into the community, but they specifically look after children and they do provide pediatric life support training. So if parents want to uh, upskill themselves, most of you may have had some pediatric life support training when your child was in hospital, when they were first born, but if you want to upskill yourself, they do provide that. So that's worth getting in contact with them for. Read the TOFS book. Uh, and ask about choosing books. So this is going about back to referrals. So choosing book is a national system. It allows you to be referred to any specialist, any NHS specialist in this country. So you don't have to just go and see your local specialist at your local hospital. You can see any specialist in this country through your GP. Your GP naturally assumes that you just want to go to a local hospital. 
But if you tell them, I want to see Mr. X in Hospital Y, they can actually send you specifically to that specialist. It's your responsibility to make your way there. But if you were living in Scotland and you wanted to go to Great Ormond Street, you can do that via the Choosen Book system. No, so your GP, this, this Choosen Book system is accessed by your GP. And quite often when you say, I want a referral to an upper GI specialist, your GP will assume that you want the local upper GI specialist. But actually, you can look up via postcode or address any hospital in the country, what services they provide, and you can be referred to any of those services. And that is a right as an NHS patient. Okay? Uh, so we are working with, towards encouraging specialists to write care plans and make them very clear in the, in the letters that we re receive. And uh, I think we've got to talk in a minute about transition. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is why I run late. Um, right. <laughs> what to do in a 10-minute consultation. So one appointment, one problem. As I showed earlier on, the GP workload is excessive. If you have multiple problems in one appointment, we will overrun. As GPs, we do not like overrunning. We always do it, but we don't like doing it because we just have in mind everything else we have to do that day. Um, try and book at the end of a clinic. So if you book at the end of the morning, at the end of the afternoon, you can have a bit of a longer conversation. Arrive on time, turn your phone off, please. Uh, be ready to strip if necessary. So if you've got a young one, unpop the buttons on their fasteners and uh, baby grows just because it takes a bit longer. Um, make sure you can answer these questions succinctly. Why have you come today? How long has the issue been present? Please do not say a while. Give specific time frames. Uh, what is normal for you and how is this different? Um, because that is very, very important, and that's something that parents can advise the doctors on that they will not know. So what is normal? The tough cough sounds horrible. Okay, it sounds horrible to you as parents, it sounds horrible to us as doctors, and we always wonder whether our child is suffering when they're having that cough. But as a doctor, we will always assume the worst when we hear that cough. But is that normal for them, and how has it changed? Um, do your research. What are your concerns? And... What would you like the GP to do and why? Make a shared decision plan with the GP. Don't finish off by, oh, by the way, while I'm here, and I must have this, because that's not a shared decision plan, and that will not be a fruitful consultation. Uh, quickly about the benefit system. Um, there has been a change where everybody's moving on to universal credit. There was a question on the Facebook page about why children move from DLA don't get PIP. Benefits are uh, functional, not medical. So they're about what you can do as a function. When we allocate DLA, they tend to be uh, much more uh, forgiving and much less thorough with the allocation, whereas with PIP, it's much more uh, definite what you have to be able to do. The benefit system is decided by the Department of Work and Pensions. If you don't get the benefits you want, you appeal, that goes to the Department of Justice, and that's when you meet somebody like me. I have never examined anybody in my role in the Department of Justice. It's all about what somebody can do functionally. Nobody has ever listened to a heart or lifted a shirt or done any kind of physical assessment on a patient in a Department of Justice tribunal. Okay? Do not ask your GP for a supporting letter because we get the reports anyway. We'll fill out the reports. Sorry. Um, that's my little one now, so I just thought I'd finish. 